Welcome. Today we're going to talk about scientific thinking, the scientific method, scientific theories, and scientific laws. Let's get rolling. The scientific method is an empirical method of acquiring knowledge that's been used since the 17th century. It involves careful observation, applying rigorous skepticism about what's being observed, given that cognitive assumptions can distort how one interprets the observation. Key word is, in my opinion, rigorous skepticism. The scientific method, when you're given information uh, about something, a scientist should be skeptical, skeptical and think of questions about every single aspect of it to be torn apart. And then you find all these proofs and then you're satisfied. A scientist should not just hear something and just accept it. You should, you should, want, you should be asking questions and get those questions answered. And that's the scientific method and that's scientific thinking. The scientific method has multiple steps. The first being an observation about the natural world that leads to a question. This turns into a sense of wonder into an investigation. And I'll just give you an example. This can be done with anything. And I'll just give you an example. Today, I was at the food court and the line for Starbucks coffee is always longer than all the other establishments. If you, you notice this, when you go into the food court, Starbucks line is insane and all these other places are just wide open. And I just started thinking, do people buy Starbucks for the name? Are they just buying it because it's Starbucks? That was just a question I had, an observation I was making because you can get coffee all over the place. And me, um, yeah, I drink coffee sometimes, but you know, I don't really notice really good coffee from other coffee. Coffee's coffee to me. I don't know. Maybe everyone's just really coffee snobs today. Right next to Starbucks, we have Baskin Robbins. And just right around that Starbucks, there's also a, also a Dunkin' Donuts. You might say, well, we like Starbucks because it's got all these, like, it's not the coffee. It's just they make the drinks so good. Yeah, look at what the kind of drinks you get at Dunkin' Donuts and the kind of drinks you can get at, at um, Baskin Robbins that are right next to Starbucks. So, that's kind of what got my mind thinking because I know about, you know, that the, you got other really good choices very close by. Once you have that question, do some research on it and have other people ask the same or similar questions. And as you do your research, you, you find other things that you'll start to kind of uncover, un, you know, open up. So like, I think the thing I was wondering was where um, Starbucks is most popular and where does it struggle? Where is Starbucks popular and where does it struggle? It doesn't succeed everywhere, I found out, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, have there been blind taste tests? Maybe you could find a study on, you know, putting coffees together without people knowing what it is. Do they pref actually prefer Starbucks over other coffees? When you're searching things like this, when you go online, use terms like study in your question or research or meta-analysis. This meta-analysis sums up a lot of different types of research and stuff like that. And I'll just share something I found with Starbucks, just going along this example, is Starbucks has been doing miserable in Australia. Um, in fact, when they went to Australia, <clears throat> um, Australians got coffee from Italy and, Greek and, and Greece immigrants back in the 1950s. So they were used to good style coffee way before Starbucks got there. And they opened up 84 outlets um, in Australia. And just years later, they racked up $143 million in debt and they had to close 60 of their stores. So it doesn't succeed everywhere. I guess in places, a lot of places in Europe and places like Australia where they know good coffee, um, they don't like Starbucks. It seems like a, um, they're, 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 I guess their, their coffee isn't as good or <clears throat> is, is equal to what they already have. And they also don't like all the sugar and, and, you know, these fluffy drinks that they make. Anyways, so once you have done some research, you come up with a hypothesis. And your hypothesis is an idea you have which can be tested to determine if it's right or wrong. So we're going to come up with an idea and we're going to test our idea to see if we're right or wrong. <clears throat> so in my example of Starbucks, a percentage of people buy Starbucks for the name on the cup. That's my hypothesis. I'm saying some people are going to Starbucks just because it's Starbucks. Because if they wanted a sweet, yummy coffee, like I said, there's Baskin Robbins, there's Dunkin' Donuts right away. And if they just like coffee, you can get coffee at any place in, in a food court. They all serve coffee. <clears throat> so that's my, my hypothesis. I think people are just buying it so they can have that Starbucks cup and show everybody at work or school or wherever they're going that they bought a Starbucks. That's, that's just my idea. It could be right or it could be wrong. So you come up with an experiment next as we go through the scientific method. 
and we design an experiment in a fair way to um, to where the conditions are constant. So we're going to design our experiment in a fair way, and we have to we have to try to keep the conditions as constant as possible. And my idea for this thing that I'm just made up today was. <clears throat> What if we made all the sh all the shops in the food court sell sell their coffee in the same generic cups for two months? So if you got it at Starbucks, if you got Baskin Robbins, you got a Dunkin' Donuts, you might have got your coffee at Subway or Taco Bell. Everybody's using the same exact cup for two months. That's my hypothesis, or that would be my experiment to test my hypothesis that they're buying it only for the name. You take away the name, let's see what happens. <clears throat> at the end of your experiment, you analyze that data that you collect. You analyze the data to see the hypothesis is correct or incorrect. Now, obviously, I didn't do this experiment, so I can't go any further here. I'm just kind of throwing out there some ideas. But you can, like I said, you can do this with anything. This is just the first thing that popped in my head because today this is what I observed. <clears throat> when you collect that data and you analyze it, you may want to change the hypothesis or the experiment design. You might have realized that the design didn't really work very well. Um, you couldn't control the constants, perhaps. Um, maybe you discover a more interesting question as you as you start collecting that data. This stage can be repeated as many times as necessary until you find the right hypothesis and test method to get accurate results. So you can kind of keep tweaking things as you learn. You keep tweaking. You build and build and build until you come up with a better um, process, a better question that actually that gets asked. <clears throat> Once you've collected that data and you've got your, your um, process down the way you like it, you report your conclusion. Um, when you're satisfied that you've proven or disproven something important, report your results. This is so people don't keep reinventing the wheel. So if you report your results, when someone else has a question and they do their research, they will find what you did and then they can add to that and make a new hypothesis and we keep building. And so this is the scientific method. It's a, a cycle that we keep building information that adds research for people and as these people do the research they come up with new questions and this is the process like I said that's been going on since about the 17th century in science it's not perfect but it sure is better than anything we've done before next thing we're going to talk about is scientific theories a scientific theory explores why things happen it seeks to explain the reason a phenomenon occurs the focus of a theory is to provide a logical explanation for things that occur in nature. There can be more than one theory about the same phenomenon, but what's unique about these theories is that they all have been verified or not verified with repeated tests. They've done these tests and the tests verify the theory. If a test do, um, goes against the theory, disproves the theory, then the theory is no longer accepted as scientific evidence. To be a scientific theory, there has to be three things um, have to be true to make it a scientific theory. The first thing is it must be falsifiable. An example, dogs can be venomous. If someone theorizes dogs can be venomous, even though maybe we've never seen a venomous dog, we cannot falsify that statement because, well, maybe there's just a, a dog that's venomous that we haven't met yet. We cannot prove this to be false. We can't prove that dog that there isn't a dog that is venomous. And therefore, this is not a scientific theory. The next thing is correlation does not imply causation. So correlations are not causations. That does not work in scientific theories. And here's an example. We have a graph here, and in red, we've got the divorce rate in Maine, and we go from 2000, and it drops down to 2005, and then it goes up a little bit and drops again. But we also have on here the per capita consumption of margarine. And if we look at the consumption of margarine, it was high in 2000, drops down to 2005, and then kind of levels off. So this correlation between divorce rate in Maine and the consumption of margin, there's a correlation between the two. But that doesn't mean causation. This doesn't mean that divorces are causing people to eat more margarine, and when there's less divorce, they eat less margarine. Or perhaps we could go the other way and say because um, people are eating less margarine, they're getting less divorces. Maybe they're becoming happy or something like that. Regardless, correlation does not imply causation. We cannot use a correlation in a scientific theory.
that doesn't make it a cause. <clears throat> the third thing in scientific theories that, that we have to avoid is selective windowing. For instance, when you get information, you have to publish all of the relevant facts, not just the ones that suit your theory. So you can't start data where it's going to be useful in your hypothesis or your theory. You have to show all of the data. Here's an example that was um, talked about for a long time in commercials for Colgate. They used to always say in their commercials, more than 80% of dentists recommend Colgate. Okay, so what does that mean to you? If 80% of the dentists recommend Colgate, you must think that that must be the best toothpaste. I mean, really, um, that's four-fifths. Four-fifths of the dentists would say Colgate is what you should use. It's a very compelling reason to, eat, to use Colgate. But how it really worked was the way they studied, the way they surveyed the dentists, they gave them all these different toothpastes and they said, which toothpastes would you recommend? They didn't have to just choose one. So they might have chosen a few of these toothpastes on here, but 80% of the time Colgate was chosen. Anyways, this was false representation of data, false representation of <clears throat> the way you're presenting things. This was windowed. They didn't give all the facts and they were sued by other companies. And since I think 2007, um, Colgate can't run that slogan anymore. They're not allowed to say 80% of dentists recommend Colgate because it's taken out of contents and it makes it seem like the other toothpastes are extremely inferior. So it's not quite, of a, quite a lie, but it was windowing those facts. <clears throat> the purpose of science is to find the truth and nothing but the truth. It's to, to use science to mislead is wrong. It's unethical. Science is just about the truth. The last thing I want to talk about is scientific law. Scientific laws predict what happens. Newton's third law of motion is objects in motion, um, I'm sorry, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. That's, that's Newton's third law of motion. So if you guys have ever seen these big balls or something like that, these people are two, these two people are jumping at each other in these big blow up balls. And I think you would know what's going to happen um, in the next frame or two. They're going to hit each other and they're going to go bouncing off each other quite hard <clears throat> because um, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And I think those bouncing balls are a great example of that. So laws versus theories. Laws tell you what will happen. Based on laws of every action has an equal and opposite reaction, we know that when these two balls hit, we know what will happen. They're going to bounce off of each other. Theories tell you why it happened. They try to explain why they're bouncing off of each other. So it's important that you can identify the difference between laws and theories and actually be able to identify if this even is a law or theory or just some other idea. That's what I want you guys to understand. So to do this, here's our checkpoints for this lesson. First thing I want you to do is search online for two different scientific theories and define them. Just get the idea of what theories are about. You can do more than two if you'd like, but at least two. Two different theories um, and, and, and look at it. See how that they are, are trying to explain how something happens, why things happen. And then do the same thing with two different laws and define them. You should see that they're telling you what is going to happen. With the laws, you should be able to say, with this, I know what's going to happen. With the theory, you know why it's happening. And finally, test questions that you need to be able to do. You must be able to identify the difference between a scientific theory, scientific law, and non-scientific idea. If I tell you something, you should be say, okay, this is telling me why something's happening. That would be a theory. This is going to tell this is telling me what is going to happen. I should be able to predict things. That would be a law. And a non-scientific idea would probably be violating one of those three things that have to be in place to be a theory. Like the first one would be um, it has to be falsifiable. It has to be a statement that can be proven false. If it's a statement that can't be proven false, then it's not scientific. Uh, it has to be if it has a correlation and causation. Um, making their statement. That's not a scientific theory as well. And the final one would be if it's windowed, if they're not giving you all the data points, if they're not sharing everything with you, you're kind of, it's kind of vague, then that would be another piece of evidence that would say it is just, it is not, it's just a non-scientific idea. So give this a shot and good luck. I'll talk to you later.